Morning, church. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I will be taking us through the first part of uh, the book of Acts, chapter 16. So before before we get into it, if, if you want to grab your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 16 with me. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll just um, give a little bit of backstory on um, chapter 15. So at the end of 15, we see um, Paul and Barnabas, they, they have a big argument. Uh, they want to go back through the places that they've already been to, um, but they can't decide who they want to take. Barnabas wants to take someone. Paul wants to take someone else, big argument, and they end up splitting. Um, in chapter 16, we follow Paul and who, and who he chooses to take with him, uh, which is Silas. So into um, Acts chapter 16 now, uh, we'll read the first uh, few verses together. So, verse 1. Paul went first to Derby, and then to Lystra where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their, on their journey. Indifference to, the, uh, yep. Indifference to the Jews of the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. Now that... Yeah, that, that wouldn't have been a great experience for him. But anyway, let's, let's go back. So Paul and Silas have rocked up to Lystra and you know they're probably visiting the people that they've met before and they hear of this guy named Timothy. Um, and everyone's talking so highly of him, saying, oh, this guy's great. He's doing so much for us. You know, he's, he's really on fire for God. So Paul hearing this is like, oh, well, let's, let's take him with us. You know, I, I want that kind of person on the team with me. So he, he would have gone up and asked. Um, and yeah, as it says, knowing that his mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek, who we can assume is unbelieving, um, he decides that Timothy should be circumcised. Now, that's, it's, it does say in here um, that it was arranged um, more so that when he was preaching to Jews and would sing to Jews, that it's one less thing that they could pick on about him. That, you know, if he was saying all the, all um, teaching them, you know, they might say, oh, well, you know, why should we listen to you? You're not one of our Jewish teachers. You know, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, it was so that, you know, they, they couldn't say that as, um, as much. It wasn't for the fact that he... Uh, for his salvation or anything like that. So Timothy decides, yeah, all right, I'll come along with you, and they, they keep moving on. So let's read verses uh, 6 from verse 6 now. So next, Paul and Silas travelled through the area of um, Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at the time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. So I've, I've made this nice map. Um, hopefully you can see it up on the screen. And we can see where they've started down in the bottom corner in Derby. They went to Lystra, then up to Iconium. And then they started heading over to the province of Asia there. And you can see I put a nice cross there to show that when they got there, the Holy Spirit didn't want them to go there. Now, I'm sure um, Paul had this nice systematic way that he wanted to go through the area that they were in, going through the province of Asia, talking to everyone there, then head up to the province of Bithynia, talk to all those people. He wanted to get talk to as many people as he could in that one area that he, that he was in. But every time he tried to go there, the Holy Spirit was like, no, nah, I, I don't want you there yet. It's, it's, not, it's not their time yet. So he decides to head over to Troas. And I'm sure that would have, you know, I don't know how Paul would have felt about that. You know, he, had, he probably had this plan in his head and every time it was changing, you know, God was closing the doors on what he thought and what Paul thought he, um, he should do. But little did Paul know that there was a greater plan 
uh, for him. So continuing on. So they, they get to this, this place of Troas um, and it's a seaport. And that night uh, in verse nine, it says, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And in verse 10, it says, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us there to preach the good news. So I imagine Paul there would have, you know, maybe a few things would have clicked for him going, okay, God didn't want me to go through the province of Asia or Bithynia. He wanted me there. He wanted me as close to Macedonia as possible. And again, if we look on that map, you can see where Macedonia is, that it's, they've actually got to go by boat over, over to it. It's a whole different um, continent. So God, God didn't want Paul to stay in the one area. He had a bigger plan for him. He wanted him, he gave him a whole new continent to go and talk to. And just going back to that, that vision, a man from Macedonia says, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And that's it. All he says is help us. And we see Paul's reaction. He's like, oh, I've got to go there instantly. God wants me there. Now, when, when someone asks me for help, I generally think or ask, what do you need help with? You know, how can I help you? What, what's wrong? So I can you know, get together my thoughts or anything I need to bring so I can help them. But Paul, he doesn't waste any time in thinking that. He, he knew what he was taking to these people. He was taking the good news, the gospel, the word to lead them to their salvation. And when you are going and giving someone that, it doesn't matter what, what they're going through. If they hear that and believe it and believe in God that, if they've got God on their side, it doesn't matter what they're going through. It, any trial that they face, if God's on their side, they will get through it. So they, they decide to, to go. Um, and in verse 11, we, we get the journey and how long it took them to get to, that, um, to get to the destination. And verse 11 says, we boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace. And the next day we landed in Neapolis in Macedonia. Now that's, that's, um, it's interesting to hear that because in future chapters, a bit of a spoiler for future chapters, we, we get the same journey, but in reverse, they start at Neapolis and they travel back to Troas and it takes them five days to do the opposite journey later on. But here it says, you know, they boarded a boat, landed at this island, and then the next day they landed in Macedonia. So again, we can see how urgent um, it was for Paul and his team to get over to Macedonia. He didn't want them walking through the province of Asia and Bithynia and all all that he wanted them to get over to Macedonia as quick as they could. So they land in they land in Macedonia at Neapolis, and then from there they reach Philippi, which is an interesting place in itself. But you'll you'll hear more about that later. So they stayed there for several days. It says in verse twelve and in verse thirteen. Um, it says on one Sabbath. We went a little way outside the city to a river bank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer and sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. Now that, when I first read that, it was, it was interesting because I, I was thinking to myself, why are they meeting at a river bank? Especially one that's outside of the city. Why aren't they in the city on the Sabbath in, in a church, in a synagogue? But they're meeting outside of the city at a riverbank. Now, back then, it took 10 men, 10 males, to constitute a synagogue in a city. So, 
the fact that they were meeting at a riverbank meant that there weren't 10 male believers in this area. It didn't matter about the women or children. It had to be 10 men. So we get a little bit of an insight into this place that there weren't 10 men at least um, who believed. And then in the last part of that verse, it says that they sat down with a group of women. It doesn't say anything about the men. So maybe there wasn't even one male who, who believed. So they sit down with this group of women. And in verse 14, it says, One of them was Lydia, a merchant of expensive purple cloth. Now this expensive purple cloth, it confuses me as to why it's so expensive. I definitely wouldn't have been paying a lot for it. Because um, when, you, when you look into it and work out how they made this stuff, it turned me away pretty quick. So this, this purple dye that they get to dye the cloth purple, it comes from a small region in the Mediterranean Sea. So yes, it comes from a small area. Okay, that, that will drive up the price a bit. But the dye comes from a small mollusk. And where does it come from, this thing? It comes from a small dehydrated mucus gland on the rear end of this thing, to put it nicely. Now, I definitely wouldn't want you to smear anything on my clothes from the back end of one of these mollusks. I de it wouldn't have smelled nice at all. So why they liked it so much and thought of it so highly and made it expensive. I don't know. But anyway, back to the story. <laughs> so, continuing in verse 14, it says, As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. So hearing this word, God opened her heart and she accepted it. And that's, that's a really important thing that if you are ever out witnessing to people or having a conversation with someone about God, teaching them that you should be praying that God can work on their heart, that they can accept what they're hearing. Because without that, are they, are they really going to fully believe and understand what you're saying if God's not working on them? And she was baptized. And it says even more, her whole household was baptized, which is awesome. It's great news to hear that. You, know, you always love hearing news of someone being baptized. And straight away, she jumps into action and wants to show God's love to everyone. And she urges Paul and his team to stay at her home. Now, who knows where they were staying previously? I mean, they're walking all over the place. They were probably staying in tents. Who knows? So to, to offer them this, this, this home for at least the night would have been great news to them. It, it did say that she had to beg them. Pretty much, she urged them until they agreed, but I'm sure that they, deep down, they were pretty happy to accept that. So that's where I'm going to leave it for the first 15 verses. That's my part done. Some pretty, you know, good things. We, we saw some good things in here. So you're probably a little bit confused by the title being a dangerous journey, but now I'm going to hand it over to Rylan, who will take us through the second half, and you can see why we, why we um, made this title. And so, the Church of Philippi was born. Thanks, Liam. And now what I'm going to get you to do, oh, we are in Acts 16 at the moment, and I'm just going to get us to look for a minute at Philippi. Because Philippi is this really interesting place in history. So... This is a city that is situated up in northern Greece in Macedonia and it is on this road called the Via Ignatia. Now this is a massive road that stretches all the way from Dyrrhachium, which is now on the Albanian coast, to Byzantium, which became Constantinople and is now today known as Istanbul. 
this is a city that was populated by a large group of Romans, and it became known as a Rome away from Rome. This is where a lot of the, the Roman veterans would come to retire, as it was a beautiful city. So now I'm going to invite you into the word, and we are in chapter 16, and we're going to pick it up in verse 16. So one day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned her masters a lot of money. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And instantly it left her. Now, when we look at this passage that starts us off, we saw, see Paul getting frustrated with this slave girl. Now, at first, when we look at it, we think, well, it seems that this girl is helping Paul and Silas's cause. She's following them around, proclaiming that they are servants of the Most High. Now, what we have to remember is that we are in northern Greece. So when the people in Philippi heard these men are servants of the Most High God, their thought would have been, okay, so these men are servants of Zeus. So Paul, after having this happen day after day, where it would have been impacting the message he was trying to get across, he finally gets so frustrated that he turns to the girl and casts out this demon. Now I'm going to invite you back into the word and we'll pick it up again at verse 19. So her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. It was at this point that they were thrown into prison and the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So for a moment, taking it from the perspective of the magistrates, we get to see this angry mob led by some of your most influential people who come and present these two people who they accuse of being troublemakers and stirring the city into a mess. Now, for these magistrates, they only really have two options. You can let these men go and fear a riot and your city falling further out of control, or you can punish these men and you can move on with your with the day and keep peace in the city. So the magistrates, they make the one decision that they can. They throw them into jail to keep the peace. Now we'll return to the word and we are picking it up again in verse 24. So the jailer put them into the inner clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. 
all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer then woke up to see that the prison doors were wide open and he assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he draws his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Do not kill yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptised. And he brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. So we see the attention of this story returning to Paul and Silas here. And these are men who have just suffered a beating and humiliation, and they come into this jail and they are praising God and singing. Now, I know from my perspective, if I had been one of the other prisoners in that prison, or is, if I was one of their guards, I would have been completely confused. Because these are men, haven't they just been completely embarrassed for trying to give their message from their God? So why would they be praising their God? Why would they not be cursing him? Now, we come to around midnight and this massive earthquake hits. Now, we see this jailer waking up and he sees his prison wide open, not a door closed in it. And he knows the inevitable result of what will happen here. So he draws his sword to kill himself. Now, it's important to understand here that while this may seem like an overreaction to us today, he only lost a few prisoners. In the Roman Empire, if you lost any prisoner, you became subject to the sentence that they had been given. So whether that was jail for life or whether that was to be killed. So when this jailer sees every door in the prison open, his assumption is that he is going to die. So we see Paul and si we see Paul shout out to him and as he shouts we see this spark of hope from the jailer. And he calls for a light and rushes in to be able to get Paul and Silas out of there. And as he does this, he falls and he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? Now, Paul's answer here speaks to us as much as it speak, spoke to the jailer. So when we come to verse 31, Paul and Silas reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And after sharing this and the word of God with the jailer, the jailer tends to their wounds and then it says at that hour, the jailer was baptized along with his whole household. Now I'll invite you back into the word to see the conclusion of their time in Philippi. So we're going from verse 35. 
The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. But Paul replied, but they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. And when the police reported this to the magistrates, they were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were, city, were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologised to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town to continue their journey. Now, when we see the magistrates trying to release Paul and Silas here, we realise that they may not have been trying to throw these men into jail because they thought they were evil men, but they were trying to keep the peace. However, Paul and Silas weren't about to leave a legacy behind for the Christians in Philippi where they could be easily persecuted by the people who had persecuted them. So Paul and Silas say, we are Roman citizens. Now, when they utter this phrase, this means that when this message gets to the magistrates, they would have been terrified. Because if you have imprisoned or beaten a Roman citizen without a trial, and this case goes to the emperor, it will result in your death. You will be finished. So the magistrates come to Paul and Silas and they apologise and they try everything they can to appease them. Now, they publicly give them an escort through the city at this point and Paul and Silas, they're not going to leave immediately. They're going to go and they go to Lydia and the other believers and they encourage them and they affirm their belief and then they continue on their way. Now what we see here from Paul and Silas is that their work in Philippi was really important. Philippi was this major city on a major trade route and Paul and Silas by targeting this city they showed us that it is important to hit these points of society where it won't just affect this one city. This will in affect entire parts of the empire. And when this happens, people can feel threatened because they see change happening and it affects them. And the way Paul and Silas affected change, it affected the wealthy in Lydia and the higher classes of society. It went to the lowest end of society with this young slave girl. And then the jailer shows us this middle part of society in Philippi. This shows us that no part of society was left unchanged. So in Paul and Silas, we see these men of great faith who would go anywhere, do anything, and suffer anything for the cause of God. So the challenge here for us is this. Are we ready? to follow in the footsteps of Paul and Silas 
And are we ready to follow wherever God will lead? Let's pray. Hey God, thank you for giving us this insight into how you work across entire groups of society. Thank you for giving us this model on how we can go out and how we can impact the world around us. Please be with us and help us to see these impact points that you want us to go to. Help us to be ready and to see how you see this and be able to go through anything for your cause. Please be with us through this week. In your name, amen.